together he's coming on the clouds he's coming on the clouds kings and kingdoms will bow down every chain will break and every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise for who can stop the lord will guide us so Lord give us a new song to sing this morning over those that may not be able to sing this morning let's sing it together who can stop the Lord yeah oh who can stop the Lord almighty oh who can stop the Lord almighty yeah. who can stop the Lord Stop.
Lord, we do come to you this morning and we give you all of those people in our world that may not have strength to sing this morning. And we pray that your presence would wrap them up, God. And that those of us that do have the strength to sing, God, we would sing on their behalf. We believe that you reign above it all. And as you reign, Lord, it is your goodness that moves you towards us. Your intention toward us is goodness. So may we believe that this morning and declare the truth of who you are, that you reign above it all. And we can trust you, God. Let's sing this together, the reign of darkness. The reign of darkness now is ended in the kingdom of light, in the kingdom of light. Forever under your dominion, you're the king of my life, you're the king of my life. You reign above it all, you reign above it all, over the universe and over Jesus, you reign above it all. On the cross, the work was finished. And on the cross, the work was finished. God, you poured out your life just to give us new life. Now from the lips of the forgiven, Hear an anthem arise, cause Jesus, you're alive. Oh, you reign above it all, you reign above it all. Over the universe and over every heart, there is no higher name. Jesus, you reign above it all. Let all of heaven and the earth erupt his song. Sing hallelujah to the everlasting one. There is no higher name. Jesus, you reign above it all. Yes, you reign above it all. We can trust you, Jesus. We trust you this morning, Jesus. You stand with us. You're with us every moment, every second. You're fighting for us. You sent the darkness. You sent the darkness running out of an empty grave. Now seated alone in glory. Throned on the highest praise, you sent the darkness running out of an empty grave. Now seated alone in glory, and throned on the highest praise, you sent the darkness running out of an empty grave. Now seated alone, let's sing it one last time. You sent the darkness running. You sent the darkness running out of an empty grave. Now seated alone in glory, enthroned on the highest parade. You reign above it all. You reign above it all. Over the universe and over. you reign above it all. Let all of heaven and the earth erupt in song. Sing hallelujah to the everlasting one. There is no higher name. Jesus, you reign
As you guys can see, the kids are with us, and every time we have the kids with us, I invite my friend Michelle to come sing. So why don't we give her a little round of applause as encouragement and excitement. And uh, we've, we've got a real hit here, you guys. I have a hard time strumming it. It's so fast, so that's why Matt's going to back me up on the beat. But um, yeah, I just encourage you to continue in that place of worship. buried beneath my shame. Oh, sorry, one second. Yeah, sorry, it's like it's not connected. It's so hard to hear without headphones, guys. Thanks so much. It's not connected. Let's see. Shove it right in. How we doing? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. All right. Sorry for the inconvenience. I was buried
we praise you for that reality, the reality of uh, your glorious day. Uh, we're gathered here this morning as um, a community following you and those joining us, exploring life with Jesus, because uh, we join 2,000 years of people who proclaim the glorious day where you got up from the grave. And we're gathered together not just because we think that there's good teaching or a good way of life to live, but because we think there's a new reality in Jesus. We've experienced that reality, Lord. And so we pray that you would uh, deepen our experience of you, deepen our belief and trust in you as we live life with you in your presence. Uh, thank you that all that is possible because Jesus has done for us what we couldn't have done for ourselves. He lived a life we haven't lived. He died a death in our place to cover all of our sin and failure and now is alive forever, and we have a future alive forever with you, a new life to be lived in the presence of our God who loves us. So we praise you for that reality, God, and thank you for our incredible team and for uh, Michelle and for Amanda leading us and uh, the guys. We're so grateful. That's right, so in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, go ahead and have a seat. As uh, we do, there's a little bit of imbalance in the room. So if you have any interest of sitting on this side, for a little bit more elbow room, you know, maybe just like you're going to get really excited during the teaching and you just want to move around, that would be uh, fantastic. And children, go ahead and go with Miss Kathy. She's in the back. Kathy, wave your hands. Yay. Okay. Uh, kiddos, you can go with her. She is going to uh, take our River Kids out to uh, their program this morning. Um, but welcome, everyone, uh, to our uh, 1030 gathering of the River Church of the South Bay. Um, for those of you that might not know, my name's Taylor. I'm one of our uh, team members here on our pastoral team. And uh, we gather every Sunday morning uh, at the beach and then here at the Catalina Room. Uh, because we believe that something special happens when the people of God gather. We see this rhythm in scripture of God's people gathering and then scattering. We gather together to encourage one another, to hear from God's word, to worship him together. And that equips us to be sent out as sent ones following Jesus and living his kind of life in the South Bay uh, and beyond where we dream about what God might do um, in and through our community, even beyond uh, our little neck of LA County here. Uh, we are in a series, we're finishing up a series today on prayer. Uh, we've taken four weeks just to look at this practice of prayer, and we're going to be doing a couple other rhythms of life with Jesus over the course of summer. Uh, we're going to, we, we've looked at prayer, we're going to transition now starting next week into looking at scripture, we're going to look at simplicity and Sabbath, we're going to look at generosity, just these habits and rhythms of God's people that we see in scripture that help us become the kind of people that Jesus invites us to become uh, as we follow him. And so uh, we're finishing up that rhythm of, of prayer today. Bill's going to teach us in just a moment. Uh, and one of our kind of corporate shared practices of prayer, and there's all real, real kinds of great ways to incorporate prayer and a praying life into our lives. But one of the things that we've been doing as a church is we've been gathering uh, at 6 a.m. on Wednesday mornings at a spot called the Pie Hole down in the Riviera Village. Uh, and we've just been, for a half an hour, gathering a group of people together to seek God's presence. And this is not the holy huddle. This isn't like for the people that are like gung-ho into prayer. In fact, of the people that are regularly coming, people are coming from all kind of different places and comfortability with prayer, truly and honestly. And not everyone has to pray out loud. It's a time where you can kind of just be there and um, and kind of soak in the presence of, of, uh, of a community praying together. And so we're going to continue putting that out there as an opportunity and a rhythm to practice some of the things that we're ta we've been talking about in this prayer series. So uh, at 6 a.m., it's at the pie hole. You can Google that if you want to find exactly where it is. It's on South Elena. I don't know the 1830s. Anyway, you're not going to remember it even if I said it anyway. So it doesn't matter. But the point is um, uh, pie hole, 6 a.m., half an hour of really sweet prayer together with God's people. And we see God really moving through these times um, where God's stoking hunger for more of his presence, more of uh, what we hope and uh, dream that he would do in and through us as a community. And so I want to invite you guys to come to that. We are also, this morning, uh, we're going to get to hear from a couple uh, from our community who uh, we're going to get to pray for, I'm putting into practice. You see the, like, seamless transitions here? This is what they teach you in preacher school. Um, so uh, we're going to get to pray for uh, a community, uh, a couple from our community that we're going to get to send out. Um, because we believe that prayer isn't just something that we do for personal experience. It's something that moves us, and this is what Bill's going to teach us in a little bit, the seamless transitions, moves us uh, out into the world. So um, would you guys join me in welcoming up uh, Barb and Joe Jackson? Yeah. 
Uh, Barb and Joe are involved in a, a ministry um, in, that serves communities in Uganda. They're going to be headed out there in just a bit. And this is something, this is, they're, they're going on this trip, but this is an ongoing uh, ministry call in their lives that we're thrilled and excited about that we support and want to get behind. And so we're going to hear a little bit more about them and what's going on in their lives. So guys, tell us about what you're doing. Okay. All right. So we work with an organization called Align International, and uh, they work primarily in central Uganda. And um, their current efforts have really been, um, they have a, a sponsorship program, a child sponsorship program. We have about 200 kids in that. Um, we have uh, a life home, what we call a life home village, which is uh, four homes that house about uh, 10 children each with a um, house mom and, or house auntie and uncle. And these children um, are, have either been abandoned or abused so badly they needed to be taken away from their parents or orphaned. And um, that we, that's our life home village. The, I guess the last big part, we also have a scholarship program for those kids after, um, actually let me talk about scholarship after I talk about the schools. Um, there's also three schools that we've established in, um, actually four. We have one high school and uh, three primary schools that go up to basically uh, middle school. And um, we also have a scholarship program um, for kids after they graduate out of the secondary school. Um, it can either be to go on to college or it can be to learn a trade. Um, and that is really where we've been focusing our efforts recently. Joe and I have been involved heavily. We've gotten the board of directors, I think, in 2015. Um, and uh, we've been involved that whole time. But um, as things have moved forward, it's um, been really clear that our best chance for, for really making a difference for those kids' lives is through the schools and as many uh, kids as possible, which is really our goal. Uh, Uganda is a country that was um, impacted very heavily by AIDS. It has kind of an upside down um, statistics in terms of, of age. About 75% uh, of their population is under the age of 25. So we're, ho we're hoping that um, by investing more in the kids, um, that those will actually help to transform Uganda um, more for Jesus. So, I mean, we're just, we're just going back there, uh, seeing how the progress is going. We, Align, which is the, the arm here in the United States, we pre pretty much um, do the fundraising, and then we help, uh, help them implement the programs that they, in Uganda, that the locals there see as best able to meet the needs of their communities. So we're just checking on a few things and um, just connecting. They're definitely our family. We haven't seen them for a while. And um, we're looking forward to that. And they will be here in the fall, so you'll get a chance to meet them. <laughs> They'll be here in the fall. So, um, yeah, and they're, they're, I mean, we can't, obviously, they're family, so we're a little biased, but, but we're excited for them, you all, to get to know them, too. So. Thank you, guys. Well, we're going um, to gonna pray. Um, but we've also, Joe, we've been praying for you um, in your battle with cancer, and um, we've got an update on how that's going. We'd love to hear, and we're going to keep praying, but would you want to tell us a little bit about what's going on with you? Yeah, I, I'd love to. So uh, <laughs> it's another seamless segue about prayer. Um, probably about a little less than a year ago, um, Barbara and I asked if uh, we could get the church to pray over me. I was uh, diagnosed with prostate cancer. Uh, it was stage four. It was in my skull, my spine, some of my lymph nodes, stuff like that. It really, at least it didn't feel too good, <laughs> I'll say about my prognosis. Anyhow. Um, prayer is an amazing thing, and today I stand before you, um, a measure they use to tell how you're doing health-wise is called your PSA level, and um, levels below, three and below, are, are considered good. Uh, four to ten, they're usually like, uh-oh, this person might have prostate cancer, we better check. Uh, mine was in the 140s, so, and it got that way in less than a year, so it was a pretty aggressive uh, cancer. Um, we came here, we've been prayed on, uh, we've gone, you know, through our treatment, and today, uh, my PSA is less than 0 .01. It's basically unmeasurable. Yeah. So, so all I'll say is clearly this is something I didn't do myself. And, and all the glory goes to God because he's the one who kept me here. Uh, we'll see what he has in mind for me. He kept me around. So <laughs> hopefully I keep my heart and my ears open to him. But uh, I, I thank you all so much for praying. It makes such a difference. And we're excited to have you praying for our Uganda trip because we know it'll make a difference there too. Thank you for sharing. Um, it's important to celebrate when we see God move. We have um, 
sometimes we bring things before God passionately and God chooses to do differently. In fact, there's things happening in our community now where that's the case, but we want to celebrate when we do see God moving. And, um, and so um, we, uh, we're going to pray for you guys and, uh, and, and send you off as a community. So would you guys all pray with me as, as, as I pray um, for Barb and Joe? Um, God, we just, uh, first, we're, just, we're so grateful um, for the healing that you've brought to Joe's body and that you've given um, his doctors wisdom and you've used uh, the treatment that he's gone through powerfully and it's been effective and you've met them um, with your presence and peace um, in the midst of their, of their battle and, um, and in dark moments. And so we're, we're so grateful for that, Lord. Um, we're grateful that you're, you're, you've been with them, you are with them, you're with every single person that, that trusts in you. Um, and God, we pray that you would use this trip they have upcoming. Uh, would you move through them? Would they encourage uh, folks on the ground who are serving through a line in Uganda? Um, we pray that you would be writing a new story um, in these people's lives who they're serving, and especially these children and young people. Um, we pray that you'd raise up a generation of Ugandans who love you, um, who have big dreams for their communities, and they want to see the flourishing of their communities and are equipped to do it and have open doors to do it. And uh, we pray that you would use... Um, Barb and Joe and the, the, the burden that you've put on their heart for this country um, in a powerful way, but beyond even what they can hope for and dream and imagine. Um, we know you have good things for them, um, good things that you're doing through them as they take steps of faith to trust you. And uh, we pray that you continue that. Um, we ask for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you, guys. All right. Yeah. Todd just said, Todd just said cool shirt. Um, so uh, we're going to be continuing our prayer series. Like I said earlier, um, Bill is going to be teaching us. So Bill, why don't you come on up? I'll pray for you. And, uh, and then you can take us into God's word. Let's pray. Lord, um, we thank you that you speak to us, that your, your, your word is living and active. And when we open up, as we hear from uh, good teaching from your word, we're not just learning Bible factoids um, we, uh, to the degree that our hearts are open to it, can actually hear from you. Um, so we pray that you would give us open hearts. And uh, right now, even let's just, each of us, um, in the quiet of our own hearts, um, whatever words feel natural and comfortable, let's just each ask God to speak right now. We can just, it could be as simple as saying, God, would you speak to me right now? But let's just ask him right now, quietly in our own hearts, um, for God to speak. God, we do ask that you would speak, um, that you give us not just information in our heads, but uh, transformation in our hearts. Uh, we ask for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Taylor. You're such a good guide for us this morning. And Amanda, you too. Just you guide us into God's presence and worship, and uh, you help us to frame what this is that we're doing. And we've been talking about prayer. Prayer is a, a, a mysterious thing, but we believe that prayer... As we practice prayer, it changes us. It's transformational. And so there's something about coming before God and bringing our requests to him. So that's why these last three weeks and now today, the fourth week, we've been addressing prayer. And we, we, don't, we don't have the assumption that this has completely revolutionized the prayer life of the river because this is just uh, a start, just a start. But the first week, uh, Taylor helped us to understand that prayer is a relationship. It's not a performance. And uh, because we have a heavenly father who wants to be in relationship with us. And as part of this, I read a, a beautiful prayer book by Richard Foster. And he says this, real prayer comes not from gritting our teeth, but from falling in love. And that's what Taylor helped us to understand. And then the next week, we saw that Jesus invites us to articulate shameless, audacious prayers. And then last week, Luke did just a terrific job of helping us to open up the door to discover the transformative power of music, particularly music and the Psalms as we pray through the Psalms and bring those to God. And this morning, the fourth and kind of our, our final for now installment, um, I want to I have us think about this idea of uh, prayer as missional prayer. And um, our key text is going to be in Colossians 4, but let me 
kind of get us thinking about missional by um, giving a definition of missional so that we can think about what, what exactly is this idea of missional prayer. And this definition comes from uh, Alan Hirsch, and he says, a proper understanding of missional begins with recovering a missionary understanding of God. By his very nature, God is a sent one who takes the initiative to redeem his creation. In the incarnation, God sent his son. Similarly, to be missional means to be sent into the world. We do not expect people to come to us. Every disciple is to be an agent of the kingdom of God, and every disciple is to carry the mission of God into every sphere of life. And one of the beautiful things about the river is when we gather together like this, we're in community and we get to say hi to one another, but there's something even more beautiful about the river that is mostly invisible to us, but it's when we all go into our everyday life of family and work and friends as, in a sense, representatives of the sent one. We are sent into, so we don't expect people to come to us, though we always invite people to be part of this gathering, but we go, and everywhere we go, we represent Jesus and the loving Father. And to quote Carolyn Carney, she says this, missional prayer is the type of prayer which propels you from your prayer closet into the world. So that's missional prayer. And I want you for a moment just to have a, 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 a picture in your mind. Imagine you're at a desk and you have a, a, a giant map of the world showing all the countries, all the continents, and that's, that's in front of you. And then you begin to draw concentric circles, what we'll call prayer circles. And the first circle you draw is around yourself. And you pray, you pray for yourself. And then you draw another bigger circle, but it's now around your family, relatives. And then you draw a bigger circle, and that circle is around your community, the river community, your neighborhood, the people that you do life with. And you pray for them. And then you draw an even bigger circle. And it's around our beautiful country. And we're called to pray for our country. And then you draw an even bigger circle. That's a circle around the whole world. And missional prayer is what draws us from praying for ourselves to praying for our community to praying for our country. And praying for the world. I thought of an alternative title uh, for this message, and it would be, um, I want you to pray for more than just a parking spot. And the idea is that, you know, we pray, oh, Jesus, please. I'm in the Trader Joe's parking lot. Just please <laughs> give me a free spot, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. You have blessed me. You're so active in my life. Now, if you're a mother with a baby... You can pray for a parking spot anytime you want. I do, yeah. And the rest of us, you know. Um, now, that doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't care about parking spots. But there can be an attitude that says, um, aren't there enough problems in our country that we don't need to be thinking about and going to all these other countries? And we have to be really careful of that sort of rationale and reasoning because what it does is it ends up walking backwards in the circle where eventually don't I have enough problems in my own life that I just focus here so missional prayer is something where God uses our beginning steps in prayer to expand our reach in the circles and what I'd like to do is I'd like to set the background before we get to Colossians chapter 4. I'd like to set the background uh, by an audacious sweep of the big story of God by only looking in four places in the Bible. And uh, I'll skip a lot, but I think this gives us uh, sort of a biblical context for this idea of missional praying that we can enter into. And uh, we start in Genesis chapter 12 where God calls Abraham, a pivotal marking point 
where God calls out a person to become a people who will love the world. This is what the Lord said to Abraham. Abraham, go. There's the mission. Go from your country, your people in your father's household, to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. This is the nation of Israel. The calling of God of a people that will represent him in the world. And I will bless you and I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Fundamental to God calling Abraham, Israel, a people, is that through them, they would bless the whole world. Now, Israel forgot that calling over and over and over and began to separate themselves in a way where it was us versus them. Then we go to the prophets right in the middle of the Bible and to these beginning sort of statements about God restoring and God creating something new and God choosing Israel. Isaiah 49, 6 says, I will also make you a light for the Gentiles. Reiterating that call to be a blessing to all the nations. That my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Now, the New Testament writers more and more understood that that was originally about Israel, but then they began to see, wait a minute, no, that's, that's actually about Jesus. That the prophecy about the light is all about Jesus in his life. I will also make you, Jesus, a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Israel, in a sense, could not live up to their calling. And so Jesus could easily be called the true Israelite. He came and did what we couldn't do for ourselves. So now the blessing goes through Jesus to the whole world, to the ends of the earth. Then we come to the New Testament and the end of Jesus' ministry. He's called his 12, symbolic for one for each of the 12 tribes of Israel, the new Israel and the 12 disciples that are following Jesus. He teaches them. Now, after his resurrection, he calls them together and he says this, which we understand as the Great Commission, but it's really a restatement of the call to Abraham in Genesis 12. To the disciples, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go. There's the, there's the missional idea again. Therefore go and make disciples of who? All nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is where we come in. We, we, are, we are the offspring of those 12 those disciples, and that's our commission. We're now in the footsteps of Abraham and Jesus and the 12 as missional praying disciples. Now, let's go to the very end of the story. We started in Genesis, now we're in Revelation. Revelation chapter 7, the apostle John is, is, is seeing what's going to take place, what is going to happen. This is our future. After this, I looked, John says, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, and they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, and that's Jesus. So when Barb and Joe go to Africa, there'll be little children that'll be part of that celebration. So that's the sweep and the story. It's not everything, but it gives you the picture that, that the story is God never gives up on calling a people that will represent him in the world so that they can be a blessing to everyone, to the whole world. So now, if you have a Bible, go to Colossians 4. Colossians 4, and we'll look at 2 through 6. And when I was uh, musing on this passage, what sort of came to me is three movements, maybe three progressions. And, you know, those of us that are up here teaching, we're always really cautious that we don't want to turn our preaching into law or rules. It's invitation. And the Holy Spirit does his individual work in each of our lives. 
And I see here sort of three movements along the transformation pathway that prayer can come into our lives. The first is in verse 2. Paul says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. So this is just starting small. This is just our lives. We, just, we offer up prayers to God. Uh, we stumble along. We, um, we maybe pray more for that smallest circle ourselves than we do for the world. But this is just where we start. This is where we're at. And we're invited to devote ourselves to prayer, to the practice of prayer. And Paul says, be watchful and thankful. There's just really something about having thanksgiving be part of our prayers. Now, I don't know about you, but I do like to read the news. I like to stay up to date. But the news can be really discouraging. In fact, the news, when we consume it or consume too much of it, it, it can be almost toxic in terms of uh, feeling like, wait, wh where do we find news that's not ending up making me feel divided and divisive? And I think Paul's word here is, he says, be watchful. This is the invitation to put a filter on our news and social media consumption. To have sort of, in a sense, a mindset of, where is God at work in the world, especially in this situation in which I am reading? And that becomes kind of a, a buffer or a, um, a, uh, a filter that can help us not allow the news to, to drag us down and cause us to be discouraged. But instead, it becomes a prayer prompt. The second movement, I think, and I'll call it uh, missional praying, is in verse 3 and 4. And look at the shift. Paul says, and pray for us too. Now, now he's shifting, inviting us to pray for him in his missionary work. That God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. This is missional praying. This is where we move beyond just the simple praying in front of us to where now we're intentional about thinking about further out in those prayer circles. We're praying sometimes for those that are doing ministry in countries where there are closed doors to the gospel. And you know that today, there's many countries where the door is slammed shut for waltzing in and proclaiming the, the gospel on a street corner. Because pastors that have done that, missionaries that have done that, people that have done that, they end up in, in prison. And there's, there's literally thousands of people that have proclaimed their life, their faith, their trust in Jesus who now are um, locked in prison. And Paul was. <laughs> Paul was in prison. I'm in chains for the, for the gospel. And he said, even now, pray for an open door. And so we begin to pray for different parts of the country, different people, different missionaries, different ministries that are doing works in places where it's much rougher going than it is here in our own context. And Paul says, Pray that I might proclaim it clearly. Proclaim the mystery of Christ clearly. And I have a friend who's in a country where the door is mostly closed, and he went there with his profession and skill as an optometrist. And he helps uh, fit people with glasses, primarily people that are underserved and, and a bit poor. But he's bringing a very useful skill into a country that would not be interested in a typical missionary coming just to bring Jesus. But out of those relationships of care, he's built opportunities to share about Jesus. I have another friend who um, serves in Morocco, and there's a lively surf culture in Morocco, and he went and he started a business where he shaped surfboards and how to shop, and then he got the idea of starting a, um, a tourism business, 
and he runs surf tours in Morocco, and he's with people for one, two, three weeks in a van, taking them to surf spots. And out of those relationships, um, he shares the message of Jesus clearly. So here's the big idea from this morning. You and I can impact what happens on the ground in Ukraine without going there physically. Now, that sounds trite on its surface. But I want you to understand the power of what I just said. And I know when there is a tragic, horrific school shooting, and then social media is filled with our thoughts and prayers go out to you, and there's just this repulsion of, of pushback for people that flippantly say our thoughts and prayers because with school shootings, we need a lot more than thoughts and prayers. But I don't want that sentiment to cause us to miss that you can impact the outcome of what happens in people's lives on the ground in Ukraine without leaving your living room. Because there is a mighty God, and our prayers can go through Jesus, our mighty God, and impact what happens in another country like Ukraine. Prayer is incredibly powerful. We pray for Joe, and Joe is right here. We can pray for Ukraine, and it's the same thing. And we leave the mystery of that to God. There's one place you can go on the Internet. It's called uh, Operation World. It's, uh, that's, that's the website, Operation World. Operation World. It's a, it's a beautiful website. Uh, it's a great prayer help, Operation World. And if you go there, um, they have daily prayer prompts, but... Really what they have is they have a whole page with a link to every country in the world. And you can click on that link for a particular country, and they will tell you what's happening on the ground with the gospel. How many believers there are, what the population is, what the, the major religions are in that country. And they'll kind of then give you sort of a listing of, of how difficult it is to share the gospel in this context. It's a, it's a super... Uh, helpful and insightful uh, ministry, Operation World. And it's something that you could use for missional praying. And then uh, third, the third movement I see in verses 5 and 6, where Paul makes another shift. And I'm, I'm going to call this inevitable engagement. And maybe inevitable is too hopeful. But uh, engagement. He says in verse 5, notice his shift again from himself back to us. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation, and I could say that really could be prayer. Let your conversational prayer be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Missional prayer is the type of prayer which propels you from your prayer closet into the world. Now, I don't know how this works in everyone's life, but there's something that happens that I see in this movement. We start with our simple prayers. We begin to expand and grow and be transformed in prayer where we're more audacious, where we're more bold, where we're, we're more expansive. Our prayers reach further out into the world, and something happens inside of us. And sometimes we're drawn into more and more engagement with a particular people group or country. And I would suggest, I don't know this for sure, but that would be true of Bard and Joe. Now, their story is unique. We're not all going to take the same pathway that they have, but I just know that the Holy Spirit has a heart and a passion for the world, for every country. And he uses believers to move into that through their prayers and sometimes their own personal engagement. Now my story. Um, when I was in, in high school, I watched um, what was happening with the Vietnam 
conflict, the war in Vietnam. And I saw the statistics on the news, and, and then I got into college, and of course it was all winding down, but I still got a draft number. There, there was no, no uh, hope that I would, hope, that's a bad word. There, there was no likelihood that I would end up going, but I had a draft number. So I thought a lot about Vietnam, and I was too young to be involved, but I had older friends that weren't too young, and they went. And I was super intrigued. And when I then moved through college and all those Vietnam War movies came out, I just thought, would I have uh, what it would take to, to, to do that, to, to be there? Um, I, I just was so intrigued. Vietnam became this mystery to me, and I began to read about its history and the, the, the religions there and, and any like any ministries there, I just, I, I, I couldn't get enough of just trying to understand this country that we had been part of and, you know, just a horrific outcome. And uh, I, have a, I have a friend, his name's Jim Creasman. He's a missionary. He, he was based in Singapore, but he used to mentor pastors of Vietnam. And it's, it's basically illegal to be um, a Christian in Vietnam. It's a communist country. Uh, you can, a pastor can go to prison there. But it's really actually quite open as long as you're open and in, in good communication with the government. But you can't go to a Starbucks and put your Bible on a table and have a Bible study or a prayer time with a friend. You, you can get arrested. You can get in trouble for doing that. And Jim used to go and mentor these pastors. And then they were going to put on a youth ministry conference. And Jim said, Bill, would you come and participate and bring some youth ministry training to uh, the pastors in Vietnam? And it was headed up by a, a young man named Pastor Kwa. And he was head of youth ministry in the largest denomination in Vietnam, which essentially brought together almost all of the people that were concerned and committed to youth ministry in the entire country. And myself and Jim and a couple other friends went, and we had the opportunity to build relationships with and to love on and to train, do, do some training, which was, which, which was uh, um, difficult because of the cultural context. And um, I've wanted to go back ever since. Now, the pandemic and other things have precluded me from going back to, to Vietnam. But it started with fear. Then it moved to intrigue, and then it moved to research, and then it moved to prayer, and then it moved to an invitation. And I, re I'm in, I am in Vietnam, and these people are the most beautiful people. And that's just my story. And it gave me the opportunity with all of that past reading and war movies to, to look into the eyes of these dedicated people Jesus followers and to see them through the lens of Revelation 17, the nations and the peoples and the tribes and the languages that one day will be standing before the throne and worshiping Jesus. Another great book on prayer by Philip Yancey, he says this, nothing spurs compassion in me like prayer. So it's a powerful force. And it's something we can do without going to Vietnam. So I'd like to um, invite us to practice missional prayer in just a, a really simple but I think maybe even powerful way. And I believe that the Holy Spirit speaks to us. He speaks to our hearts, especially if we'll listen. So I'm going to give us the opportunity for a few minutes, just a few minutes, to listen to the Holy Spirit. And to invite him to speak into our hearts. And this is what I'd like you to invite the Holy Spirit to say. Holy Spirit, would you bring to my mind a specific country in our world that I can pray for in the next few moments? Now, don't, don't let the first country that comes to your mind you don't, don't think of the country that you want to do an exotic vacation in. <laughs> just pause. And I'm going to invite you just to breathe, breathe, and 
just open yourself up to the Holy Spirit. He's here. He's present. He's alive. He guides us and leads us. And just pray, Holy Spirit, will you speak into my mind and my heart about a specific country? Maybe that'll be through a people group, like, like an unreached people group or a, a group of people that are oppressed, maybe because of poverty or human trafficking, or you have a personal relationship or connection with someone in a country. And this is not your commitment for a lifetime to end up being there as a missionary. It's just for these moments, just for today, as a practice of prayer. So let's just be real quiet. And Jesus, we thank you that you hear our prayers by faith. Pray that you would change us and change our world. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, we're going to pass the communion elements and go ahead and take those. But I'd like to do a little feedback, a little engagement. Um, if you don't mind, maybe you would tell us uh, what country came to your mind and why. And just put your hand up so I can, you know, just say yes. What country came to your mind? China? How come? Yeah, a beacon for God. Beautiful. I love it. What else? Sudan. Yeah, yeah, it's a beautiful prayer, yeah. A very mysterious country, and there's been some horrible things that have happened there. Yeah. Someone else? What country popped into your mind or people group? Syria and... Swimmers, that's right, yeah. 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 The refugee crisis in Syria is, I mean, it's overwhelming. Overwhelming. Anyone else? Don't be shy.
Absolutely. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Paul said, you know, our, our battle is really not against people. It's against the powers, the, the power, the evil one, the principalities. And that, that's that evil, systemic, structural, sometimes governmental oppression of people. And so, yeah, the call is sometimes not to pray against and hate people. It's, it's to pray that Jesus would break the stronghold of principalities in certain parts of our world, certain countries. Yeah. Well, um, Taylor's going to come guide us into communion. The worship team's going to come on up. Well, maybe they're already here. <laughs> That's beautiful. Uh, you know, I was thinking, if we can be on a, on a plane... And we can get the internet on our plane, and um, and that that uh, cell, it, it's got to go and hit, bounce off some satellite, someplace in outer space, and it can make a connection. Think how much more effective the prayers that we just offered up to God. It's it's instantaneous, and the call. This is gonna sound trite. The call never drops. So uh, God bless you in that. Taylor, lead us in the Lord's Supper. Thank you, Bill. Um, you know, Bill took us uh, in his survey of the story of Scripture uh, to this text in um, Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, where God says to Abraham, through you, all the families of the earth, all the nations of the world will be blessed. And the through you was the coming of Jesus, that through the, the line of Abraham, Jesus would come, that the, the creator of the universe would enter into the human story, become one of us, and live differently than any of us have lived, live the life free of sin and perfect relationship with the Father, um, but then go in our place and carry the cost of my sin and your sin in his body on the cross, that we could be set free. And that is the great hope of the world, is that God has done for us what we couldn't have done for ourselves. God's made a way that we haven't been able to make on our own, couldn't make on our own. And that's what we celebrate. Um, God's love for the world, God's love for us on full display in the victory of Jesus' cross. Victory over our sin, victory over the powers of darkness, victory over fear and shame and guilt. Um, and we declare that over ourselves this morning. And so we're going to celebrate communion declaring the finished work of Jesus, the forgiveness of sin, the cleansing of shame, and uh, full reconciliation to a God who loves us. So right now we're going um, to celebrate this for any, anyone that would have a, a personal experience of Jesus, and we're going um, to take in remembrance of Jesus. Jesus said to take the bread, which is his body broken for us, and we take in remembrance of Jesus, and we'll, let's take together in remembrance of him now. took the cup and he said this is my blood poured out for you this is blood that covers every sin past present and future and we take in remembrance of Jesus together now God we thank you for the good news the good news of the finished work of Jesus on the cross that's good for us that all of our sin past present and future is covered in full that we can know you and live life with you and we have a great hope of future of eternal life restoration of everything that was lost because of the fall and it's good hope it's good news for the world so we pray that we would be a people shaped by this good news we pray in light of this good news and thank you that you invite us to participate with you in what you want to do in the world by praying by seeking you to do what only you can do it's in jesus name we pray worship.
Jesus, when I'm in your presence, you make all things new. Sing, you can have it all one last time. You can have it all, Lord, every part. Yeah. Every part of my world. Would you take this life? our prayer this morning. Take this heart, breathe on it, breathe life, rearrange all the things inside of us that pull us away from your presence and your power and your love. We fully surrender this morning, God, each and every one of us. Whether you call us to pray for Uganda or our families or the city, God, we take your lead in it and we surrender to you. And we know that it doesn't go unnoticed, doesn't go unseen or heard, but that you are with us and you give us your love and you give us your presence. So out of that place of being known and seen and loved by the King of Kings, may we respond in worship and in prayer so you can have it all, God. All the fear, all the hope, the dreams, the ups and the downs, it's all yours and we trust you with it. Hey, one last thought as we close. This last four weeks has been powerful. It really has, hasn't it? I mean, Bill, Taylor, Luke, you've done a great job of leading us in the practice of prayer. And that's what we want to leave today thinking about is that every, every single one of us has the power of heaven at our fingertips if we really understand what prayer is all about. Prayer moves the needle around the world and you and I all of us just think of the power that's in this room if we practice prayer and uh, we leave today thinking about that that uh, we have that power at our fingertips when we open our mouths when we have a thought and pray for someone else and pray for what's going on in the world one last story I have to tell you this story Open Doors Ministry is a ministry that supports the persecuted churches around the world. Ron Boyd McMillan came and spoke on behalf of the persecuted churches. He travels the world meeting with Christians that are persecuted. And he came back with this one story. Many years ago, and I never forgot this story, he met with a pastor that was imprisoned in in Russia in the Gulag Archipelago, the famous prison in Siberia where most prisoners die of not starvation, not of persecution, but they freeze to death in prison. This pastor was freezing to death. He was going to freeze to death. And he felt God's breath on him. And he believed and he heard from the Lord that these are the prayers of Christians around the world that prayed for him and it kept him alive by bringing the breath of God, the warmth of God, physically, literally the warmth of God and kept him alive in the gulag. He survived to be able to tell the story that when we pray, God moves and God literally through the prayers of other people kept him alive. I've never forgotten that story. And every time I pray for someone else in the world, I recognize the fact that God is moving in another part of the world through our prayers. That's what we get to do. That's the power of prayer. And may we be a people of prayer that move the needle around the world because you and I, as we're driving in our cars and as we're sitting on the beach or whether we're in our private rooms praying, God moves the needle. Let's go. Let's be a people of prayer. Amen. Have a great 4th of July.